There was a question raised about HIV. Uh, I wish uh, the colleagues can give their details because I'd like to, we spend too much time discussing it. I'd like us to discuss that. Because the questions I raised then, I'm still raising them today. today. Uh, you see, for instance, I say, uh, AIDS, the acronym. The acronym is Afri uh, immu uh, Acquired Immune <laughs> Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. It's not a disease. It's not AIDD. Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. Now, a syndrome, in medical terms, is a group of diseases. The syndrome. So all of these diseases, which fall within this syndrome, meningitis, HTB, uh, they're in the syndrome. Now, when people then say to me, uh, HIV causes AIDS. I say one virus causes a syndrome. It diseases a whole syndrome of diseases with known causes. Causes of which tuberculosis are known and it's curable. But it's part of the syndrome. So you can't say one virus causes all of these illnesses. What you can say is that this virus impacts negatively on the immune system. It ne impacts negatively on the immune system. It's that weakened immune system which results in the syndrome. But there's a consequence to that kind of thinking which is therefore when you go to test and that test says HIV positive, the uh, material, the fly sheets that would be in that container with the testing will say, the fact that this thing might say you are HIV positive, it does not necessarily mean you got the virus. What it means is that the immune system is responding to something that is threatening the body. And therefore you need a clinical analysis in order to, to determine what is this thing that the immune system is rejecting. It's, it's in standard, it's in all the medical documents that go with it. And it's correct. Because then you've got to go and do this clin clinical examination in order to, t to determine which of these illnesses in the syndrome is the one that's affecting this person. And then you treat the person for that particular disease. I'm giving that as an example that the questions I asked then, I still answer, ask them today. If you say there's a virus which causes a disease, I understand that. But they're not saying that. There's a virus which causes a syndrome. I'm not a medical doctor. But the logic of it to me, that sounds funny. Uh, unless you say, uh, there's a virus, HIV virus, which has, it impacts negatively on the immune system. When it talks about immune deficiency, it produces immune deficiency, among other things, which results in the body then becoming open to this syndrome of diseases. And bear in mind that medical science itself has got many other causes of immune deficiency. Malnutrition causes me, it's sustained. Malnutrition causes immune deficiency. 
And so you can have immune deficiency which results in a syndrome with no HIV involved. Syphilis. Unproperly treated syphilis. Its symptoms go down when in fact the thing is still there. It will produce Im immune deficiency. I mean, that's a science, it's a medical science. Yeah. So I'm saying when I ask the questions then, which I continue to ask, how do you explain all of this? Uh, so we tried to do our best to, I'm back at what I was saying earlier. You know, when, when people say, those of us who are old enough will remember this. Uh, in the 90s, that, uh, you know, this HIV and AIDS has hit South Africa. It's going to decimate the population. Real killer. So we are all in government and so we discuss this thing and say, but this is what we are told. There is this disease, it's called, which is really going to decimate the population. And therefore, we have to respond to it in an effective manner. What is that response? So my view is that colleagues and comrades, let us study this phenomenon so that we understand it properly, so that we respond properly. And indeed, without medical, being a medical scientist, you read and read and read, read lots and lots of stuff. And that's where you get these questions raised by medical people. Uh, this thing that you call a disease is not a disease. It's a syndrome of diseases. Uh, okay. Uh, in which case, what's my, what's my response? Uh, you can't say it be solved by an aspirin. No. The various interventions you need, which is why the question was raised uh, by the then Minister of Health in a very dramatic fashion. Nutrition. Nutrition is very, very critical to solving this problem. And that's why she was saying, therefore you must take garlic and beetroot and so on. She was not saying, uh, those things, then you are going to be cured. She was raising the matter about the importance of nutrition. And those particular types of foods, even today, have been raised in the context of this COVID-19. The same, same thing. <laughs> but there's somebody who's making a lot of money out of this particular story. And so you st stand up and say something which is threatening the prophets, and then you are in real, real trouble. Thanks. We, the ANC, uh, has been a Pan-Africanist organization from its birth. So the questions that are raised, for instance, about SADC, integration within the SADC region, this has been part of the concept of the African National Congress forever integration on the African continent. Uh, that's why I'm saying that we've supported very much our government correctly, this continental free trade area. Uh, now, we, we've got to communicate our messages correctly. I agree with the point that was made. Countries in this region, South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, Lesotho, and so on, the point that was made. Not that uh, they should exist to exist as independent countries, but this matter about integration, uh, the possibility to develop the economies together. Uh, at one point, we, uh, in the government, decided that there must be some way by which we help the, when the tourists, tourists come to South Africa, help to get them to go over the Dragonsberg Mountain into Lesotho. 
So we'll try and build roads and then do whatever. Because this idea of integration among ourselves. It's a strong idea, we have to act on it. But I'm saying, there is a, the, the obvious thing that will happen, it will continue to happen, eh, of other Africans coming to this country. Now, I don't believe that we can have, now I'm talking from the point of view of the ANC, you can't have an immigration policy which is just defined by chase away these foreign nationals. You can't. <laughs> Yeah. It needs proper management, there is legislation, it needs an agreement across the continent. Yeah. If, if the South Africans feel that there are too many Nigerians coming, then let's engage the Nigerian government to say let's manage this thing together. Because if, if we communicate one message to the rest of the continent, that the major objective of South African immigration policy is to chase away foreign nationals. We can't, we can't have a policy like that. You know, even today, uh, before the continental free trade area, all these big supermarkets, shop right checkers or whatever the answers are, they are all over the continent. So we want the rest of the continent to say, okay, your main task is to chase away people you call foreign nationals. We are going to chase you away too. As the ANC, you can't lead a process like that. It's not right. Uh, you know, uh, 2010, 2011, 2012, thereabouts, there was quite a lot of this, the so-called xenophobic attacks in the Western Cape against Somalis. Uh, because these South Africans are xenophobic, away with the Somalis. It was nothing like that. It had to do with the relations among traders. As a result of which, for instance, there was an agreement signed uh, with traders from Guguletu, this local South African, and the Somali traders. And the agreement says things like, with regard to these main products, like bread, like milly meal, we must all of us charge the same price. There must not be price competition among ourselves. Uh, in this area, there should be no more, of if we have a, a, a hundred uh, uh, spaza shops, no more than 30 should be owned by the Somalis. It was a no negotiated agreement signed by the traders, uh, and that was the end of the violence against the Somalis. I'm, I'm, I, keep, I keep insisting to this day, and people say that I'm crazy or denialist or something, that the black population of South Africa is not xenophobic. You don't get ordinary people in Alexander Township who wake up in the morning and decide, we don't like the Zimbabweans, let's get them. It doesn't happen. Or, or Nigerians or something. Somebody else organizes that. <clears throat> Somebody organizes it and says, uh, like the Cape, the Cape Town, the Western Cape instance I'm talking about. When these traders launch everybody, we, don't, we hate the Somalis, let them go home. Yeah, they are taking our jobs and so on. It's traders who are being outcompeted by the Somali traders. And when the matter is addressed and resolved, suddenly, for years and years, you've never had any xenophobic attacks against the Somalis in the Western Cape. So I'm saying, colleague, the colleague who raised the matter about migration, 
I think we as South Africans need to sort our thinking about this thing correctly. We see ourselves, uh, certainly from the ANC side, as an important engine for the transformation of the continent for the better. And indeed, the rest of the continent, when it engaged us in, in the struggle against apartheid, the hope was exactly that, that a liberated South Africa would be in the front ranks in terms of the transformation of the continent for the better. You can't play that role and be respected by the whole continent that at last in South Africa is doing something good for the continent. When you define yourself as somebody whose main task is to chase away foreign nationals. It's contradictory. It's a challenge you've got to deal with because people will come. Uh, if, if somebody, if the government here had decided to do what uh, President Trump tried in the United States, to build a wall and electrify fences to, in order to keep a fortress South Africa. It wouldn't work. The people would still come. And I would never want to see a South Africa which encircles itself with electrical fences. There was a leader, one of the leaders in, uh, in Lesotho, a political leader. He says to me one day that uh, his mother says to him, uh, can you please give me 40 rand? Uh, sure. So I give my mother 40 rand. And she says to me, no, I, I need it because I'm going to Bloemfontein. They are in Maseru. Uh, what are you doing in Bloemfontein? No, no, I'm going for a medical checkup. No, but if you're going for a medical checkup, they're going to charge you more than for the rent. And she says, no, no, no. I don't need it for the hospital. Is this boys at the border gate? Immigration. Sometimes they're silly. They delay you, so you pass them 10 rand or something. That's all I need the money for. And then when you get to Bloemfontein, the hospital, she's got a South African ID number, card. She says, no, this is why I produced this and that's fine. And he said to me, you know, I didn't know my mother in the South African ID card. She had. Yeah. Yeah. The reality, part of the reality here is that you have many people who cross from Eswatini to South Africa to collect grants. It's the same for Lesotho. Now, do you want to put an electrical fence there to stop those people coming? Yeah. These are other foreign nationals who are coming to take your grants. South Africa has got to be bigger than that. Yeah. <clears throat> And certainly the matter about integration uh, is critical to the issue that we're talking about of the transformation of the African continent. Integration, for instance, of our region here in terms of trade and, and, and all of these things. We have a, a, a SADC agreement, a SADC agreement which provides for free movement of people as part of that process of in integration, free movement of people. The African continent has got a similar protocol which addresses the same thing, the free movement of people. Does South Africa say, okay, you please move freely among yourselves except here? Yeah. Then South Africa ceases to be part of the African continent. 